Hello, my name is Rachel Tesmer. I'm a doctoral student and clinical fellow in the Aphasia Research and Treatment Lab under the direction of Dr. Maya Henry. Our lab is housed in the Department of Speech, Language, and Hearing Sciences at the University of Texas at Austin. Today I'll be speaking with you about primary progressive aphasia. We'll start off by describing what primary progressive aphasia is, what causes it, the different variants of primary progressive aphasia and how each of those present. We'll talk about treatments, um, and then we'll conclude with some communication tips for communicating with individuals with primary progressive aphasia. I want to start off by talking about what aphasia is generally. An aphasia is an acquired language impairment that leads to difficulty expressing and understanding language. So it's important to remember that aphasia is not a problem with memory for events, intelligence, or reasoning skills. Several things can cause aphasia. Um, people typically think of stroke when they think of aphasia. Um, tumors and head injuries can also lead to aphasia. And the focus of today's talk is aphasia that's caused by neurodegenerative disease. So primary progressive aphasia, um, shortened to PPA, is a neurological disorder that's caused by neurodegenerative disease. It was first described in 1982, and the chief complaint is that language abilities become slowly and progressively impaired. It primarily affects areas of the brain that are important for speech and language. So looking at the left hemisphere of the brain, this would be the temporal lobe, as well as parts of the frontal lobe and the parietal lobe. There's quite a bit of inter-individual variability in PPA, um, but it's really characterized by a gradual decline in speech and language capabilities. Um, and communication difficulty is the primary contributor to impaired activities of daily living. So while there is variability in initial symptoms, the emergence of new symptoms, the rate of progression and the impact on daily activities, um, this kind of gradual decline uh, that's characteristic of the progressive nature of PPA is, is a unifying feature. It's also important to uh, think of PPA and remember that it's language, not memory, that's primarily affected in initial stages. So PPA is often referred to um, as a dementia, but it is quite different than Alzheimer's dementia. Um, so really in those first couple of years, it's, it's language that's pr primarily affected. So what causes PPA? Um, PPA is caused by neurodegenerative diseases that affect the language areas of the brain. So the frontotemporal lobar degeneration or FTLD spectrum of disorders, Alzheimer's disease, um, as well as cortical basal degeneration, progressive supranuclear palsy, and amyotrophic lateral sclerosis can all cause PPA. And so when we're thinking again about what language areas of the, are the, of the brain are impacted, um, we can also kind of think of the neuropathology that's causing this PPA. So it can often be thought of as a proteinopathy, so proteins such as tau here on the left or TDP43 on the right, and then of course Alzheimer's disease, which would be on the right. There's three different variants of primary progressive aphasia, which give us a little bit of a clue to the underlying pathology. So an individual is first diagnosed with PPA, and then they're kind of divided into a variant based on their speech production features. So the first variant that we'll talk about is the non-fluent variant, which you might also hear referred to as the achromatic variant of primary progressive aphasia. And these individuals have impaired syntax and or motor speech. With semantic variant PPA, um, a distinctive feature is an impaired semantic processing. And the logopenic variant of PPA has individuals with impaired phonological processing. Individuals who have the non-fluent variant and semantic variant more typically have underlying FTLD, whereas individuals with the logopenic variant more likely have underlying Alzheimer's disease. 
So first let's talk about the non-fluent variant of PPA and look a little bit more into the specific characteristics of how these individuals present. These individuals have difficulty producing and understanding complex grammar and syntax. They also have difficulty with articulation. So their speech might be more effortful or halting and there will be speech sound errors. So distortions, deletions, insertions, substitutions. Um, these error rates tend to increase with longer words. Um, there also seems to be more errors with volitional utterances rather than reactive utterances. And these errors can be pretty inconsistent. Um, the language impairment with this non-fluent variant PPA is often also accompanied by motor impairments like dysarthria and apraxia, which can also lead to this um, imprecise articulation. These individuals do not have difficulty understanding single words, nor do they have difficulty recognizing objects or what they're used for. Um, they might mix up yes and no, uh, but this is related to language and not cognition. So if we were looking at an example from the Western aphasia battery, looking at the classic picnic picture, and someone who had non-fluent variant PPA was describing what they saw, their production might look something like this. Picnic on the two and fly a boy, fly a kite and man fishing and sailboat wave waving. So you can see some errors, um, a little bit more halting speech, and you'll notice some grammar difficulties. The semantic variant PPA um, presents differently. These individuals have difficulty recognizing objects in their use, as well as difficulty understanding single words, and difficulty with word finding, so being able to come up with a name or come up with a word when they're trying to. So they often might use vague words, so thing or stuff, or they might use the wrong word, so they might say cat when they mean dog. These individuals don't have any problem repeating things that they hear or problems with articulation or grammar. They might have a bit more trouble reading and spelling irregular words. So something like island, for instance, where you have a silent S. And so if an individual with semantic variant PPA was looking at this image and trying to come up with the name for it, this might be an example of what they would say. Um, let's see. Am I seeing it correctly? There's two different colors, darker in the front, lighter in the back. It's that one animal, I don't know. So you can see that clearly they're appreciating these visual features. Um, they can kind of get to the point where they know that it's an animal, but they can't really use these features to identify the specific animal or come up with the name of it. And finally, logopenic variant PPA. Um, these individuals also have difficulty with word finding, similar to the individuals with semantic variant PPA. Um, a notable thing about individuals with logopenic variant is that they also might produce words that have the sounds mixed up, and they have difficulty repeating things that they hear. They, in contrast to semantic variant PPA, do not have difficulty recognizing objects or what they're used for, um, they don't have difficulty understanding single words, and they don't have any problems typically with articulation and grammar. However, they might have some difficulty putting sentences together. So if an individual with logopenic variant PPA was trying to name candelabra, um, their production might be something like, I've got parts of this rattling around in my head. It's like having two out of three syllables, a cal, a candela, a candelabra. And so neuroimaging is not necessarily required to get a diagnosis of PPA, but it is helpful to get what's called an imaging supported diagnosis. And so here you can see the distinct kind of um, patterns where we see a little bit more atrophy in individuals who have the different variants of PPA. So for individuals with non-fluent PPA, there's more left hemisphere posterior frontoinsular involvement. Um, we might also see a widening of the sylvian fissure in non-fluent patients. 
For individuals with semantic PPA, there's more anterior temporal lobe involvement. And for individuals who have um, PPA where it is more language dominant than behavioral, we really see um, this is much greater in the left than it is the right hemisphere. And finally, for individuals with logopenic variant PPA, we see left posterior parasylvian and temporal parietal involvement. So how does PPA progress? Um, the stages aren't really uh, well-defined at this point. Um, and progression can be complex because it depends on a variety of factors, including what the underlying disease is. Um, so progression is highly variable person to person. Both the rate of the changes and the type of changes vary. And what often begins as a subtle disorder of language can progress to a nearly total inability to speak. So some patients become mute, um, unable to understand spoken or written language, um, even though some of their other behavior is otherwise normal. In other individuals, though, we'll see that difficulties end up extending beyond the language domain. So it might progress to a more global dementia where we see difficulties with memory, problem solving and reasoning. We might also see motoric changes. So they'll be more likely to have falls or um, present with swallowing difficulties. And there may also be behavioral and personality changes. So you might see less of a desire to initiate and interact with others. Um, difficulties with impulse control. In terms of speech and language, something that we typically see more of with progression is more empty or vague speech. So that thing on the stuff. Um, and more difficulty understanding what things are. So perhaps using a broom to clean up spilled milk. One thing I want to highlight here is who makes up the care team for an individual with PPA and also to highlight that this care team is not just for the individual with PPA, but also for their family as well. And so this obviously includes their primary care physician, who's kind of an expert on the individual's health and case history, as well as a neurologist who plays the key role of giving the diagnosis of PPA. Psychiatrists are another important member of this team, as are neuropsychologists who typically do the battery of assessments that they use when they're coming up with the diagnosis of PPA and ruling out any other um, possibilities. Social workers are also an important member of this care team, again, both for the individual with PPA as well as their loved ones. And the same goes for counselors. Um, they can play a really important role in um, managing mental health for both patients and their families. Speech language pathologists are also a part of this care team. Um, while there's not many speech language pathologists that necessarily specialize in PPA, um, speech language pathologists who have expertise in stroke and dementia will have the same tools that they need. And a support group can be another really important part of the care team. And we'll talk a little bit more about this later, but meeting with other individuals who are going through the same experience can be really beneficial. And so for all of these, it's important to try and find people who have experience with PPA or who have experience um, with dementia. Um, because PPA is more rare, you want to make sure that the people that you're working with are well-versed. Another thing to consider with the PPA care team is that this team evolves and adds members as the disease progresses or as the disorder progresses. So this might ultimately involve nursing staff, um, people who work at assisted living and palliative care, other therapy um, such as occupational therapy and physical therapy, um, perhaps music and art therapy, and something that it's is easy to overlook, but elder law attorneys also might be an important part of this care team, especially as you're making decisions and planning for the future. So one question that comes up with PPA a lot when we talk about treatment is, is there a cure? And if so, what is the cure? And the unfortunate news is that there currently is no cure for PPA. However, it's important to remember that just because there's no cure does not mean that nothing can be done. So I'm gonna talk about three different um, kind of facets of treatment for PPA. 
first I'll talk about pharmacological interventions, then lifestyle changes, and we'll go quite a bit in detail on some speech and language treatments. So first we'll start off with pharmacological treatments. Um, for this, it's important to remember that you're not seeking to um, cure the PPA itself, but these are medications that are used for managing symptoms that arise with PPA. So things like memory function, alertness, anxiety, and depression. So selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or SSRIs, are something that might be commonly prescribed um, to help with symptoms such as anxiety and depression. Um, for instance, common brands like Celexa or Lexapro. For individuals who have logopenic variant primary progressive aphasia, um, cholinesterase inhibitors, so things that you might prescribe for Alzheimer's disease, um, may also be beneficial to them. And so these can be things like Aricept or Alexon. And so you'll notice that depending on the variant, um, different uh, medications may be beneficial or they may be harmful. So always be sure to consult with your doctors and your care team. Lifestyle changes have also been um, something that doctors will recommend to individuals with PPA. Um, these include um, managing a healthy diet, so either a heart healthy diet, um, some suggest a Mediterranean diet, engaging in physical activity regularly, um, mental and social engagement, and then also good sleep hygiene. So for speech and language treatments, um, these are really tailored to the communication difficulties of each individual with PPA. And so the goals of these treatments can be to maintain adequate communication and social connections, to maximize an individual's current speech and language abilities, and also to explore other ways to communicate. So explore multimodal communication. Um, and studies have shown that speech and language treatments can lead to changes in these speech and language behaviors, as well as changes in neural processing. However, there's a few caveats I wanna mention with this. Um, typically, the gains that we see might be limited to the specific skills that are treated. Uh, Relearned vocabulary needs to be continually practiced to be maintained. And it's important to, again, remember, just like with the pharmacological interventions, that therapy is not going to stop the progression of the underlying disease. Um, the majority of treatment studies for PPA uh, address lexical retrieval, so being able to come up with the word, uh, sentence production, and written language. And we'll talk in detail about a couple treatments that our lab at UT Austin provides in a few slides. So an ideal approach to speech and language treatment in PPA is using a staged approach. So it's kind of this iterative cycle with evolving goals where you're assessing language abilities, treating, assessing again, adjusting treatment and treating, assessing and treating um, with these evolving goals. So at milder stages, the goal might be to rebuild lost skills. Next, it might be to come up with different strategies for communication. I like to think of these as different tools in the communication tool belt. Then you might shift more towards aided approaches, so using low-tech and high-tech tools, and ultimately working on environmental supports and communication partner training. So again, with speech and language treatment, because it can be so individualized, um, it can benefit individuals who are at mild stages and who have more severe language impairments um, through their PPA. So I wanna talk a little bit about these aided communication devices that I talked about. Um, so we have these high tech and low tech. So high tech can be things like speech generating devices, um, mobile devices, even a laptop can be a high tech communication aid. Low tech communication aids like memory books and communication books are something that we frequently recommend to our patients um, because they're so easy to personalize. Um, and they're easy to use and beautifully they're created with active input from patients and their families. So you can include personal information like your name and address, 
photos of your family, friends, hobbies, um, restaurant preferences, travel. Um, and it's also easy to tailor to individual needs. So um, if you have difficulty seeing small text, it's really easy to create enlarged print. You can create this the size of a, a binder or the size of a wallet. So I wanna show you a couple examples of what pages from a communication book might look like. So here you can see pictures of a patient's family members that have their names and a little bit of information about them, right? So these kind of simple statements about their relation, what they do, what they like. You can also have um, images and pictures grouped thematically. So this might be clothing or getting dressed. And some participants find it helpful to have a page in a communication book about their aphasia um, to help them explain to people what is difficult for them and what they might need. And in line with this, something I wanted to bring up was um, aphasia cards. And so aphasia cards are something that you can either create yourself, like on the right, or that um, websites already have good resources for you to create. So this one on the top left is from aphasia.org. And so you can either, um, with the aphasia.org one, it's really simple and you can just input your first and last name and that you're someone who has aphasia. With the personalized cards, you might want to include things um, like strategies that can be helpful for you to either understand or that other communication partners can do. So slowing down or giving you extra time. So I want to talk about um, some speech and language treatments that come out of our lab at UT Austin. And these treatments um, seek to capitalize on spared cognitive and linguistic processes to improve language function and help preserve targeted skills against disease progression as much as possible. So the two treatments that we're going to talk about are uh, video implemented script training for aphasia, shortened to VISTA which is used for individuals with non-fluent variant PPA, and lexical retrieval treatment, which is used for individuals with semantic and logopenic variant PPA. So the goal of VISTA is to help improve fluency in individuals with the non-fluent variant um, where they work on functional scripts. So we have individuals tell us topics that are important to them. They might wanna be able to converse about we get information from them and we have them tell us about it so that not only can we get information and details, but we wanna get the way that they would say things. So we can make it sound as much like them as possible. Then we tailor it individually and we formulate scripts for them with their input. So let me give you an example of what some of these scripts look like. Um, at the top here, the script about football, you can see is, um, for someone who might be a little bit further along in their PPA progression. So it's a couple of sentences. The sentences are pretty short and straightforward with pretty simple grammar and syntax. Whereas the script at the bottom about fly fishing is quite a bit more complex. So again, really able to individually tailor it not only to interests and in the way that you might wanna say certain things, but also to your current language abilities. And the goal with these being functional is that with these scripts, um, participants will be able to kind of pick and choose chunks from the scripts to use in conversations. So I wanna go over the procedure of what VISTA looks like. Um, and typically with VISTA, you are meeting with a clinician or the patient is meeting with a clinician twice a week. And the, the protocol starts from a bit more structured treatment to a bit more of a functional application. So they'll see, their sentence from a script um, with a couple other alternatives and have to choose which is the correct one. When they've got their correct sentences, they organize them in the order of their script, they read it aloud, they answer questions that the clinician presents to them with sentences from their script. They then produce the script from memory, so from tell me about football, and then they can respond to questions out of order from their script. And once a week, um, typically during the second session, there's also a conversation partner. So an, a person who's never spoken to the individual with aphasia before, who engages in an informal conversation about this topic. So again, giving them that functional application and functional practice using the script. 
These individuals also have 30 minutes of daily home practice where they speak along to a video recording that's focused on the speaker's mouth. So it looks a little like this. I like watching TV. So you can see that they get a little bit more focus on um, the mouth and a little bit of good input for over articulation. So next I want to direct you to look at some of the results of the study that we did on VISTA. Um, what we can see here in black are the pretreatment. Um, in white is post-treatment, and then these three bars to the right are at three months, six months, and one year following treatment. And what we see is that there's an improvement in production of correct, intelligible words from the scripts for trained topics. There's an increase in intelligibility for both the trained and untrained topics. We also see a reduction in grammatical errors for trained topics. And we also see these a maintenance of these gains for the trained scripts for up to a year. Next, I'll talk a little bit about the lexical retrieval treatment, where the goal is to improve word finding in individuals with anomia. So they're trained on functional words. So we have them take pictures of items in their home. And we work on implementing strategies for self-cueing, so circumlocution and giving information about an item, as well as the written form and associated sounds. So if I showed a participant this picture, I would ask them to name it, and then you would have a semantic self-cue where they would ask, you would ask them to tell you all about it. What's it used for? What is it made of? Where do you find it? They then try and write the name of the item. Um, you can give them the first letter and then have them try and make that sound, try and write the word again, and ultimately have them read the word aloud. Then they read and write the word a few times. You ask them some questions about the item um, to kind of make sure that they have a good understanding of it. And then you ask them to, again, tell you some important features of the item, tell you the name of the item, and have them write the name again. And so with this, there's also a home practice that's adapted uh, from the copy and recall treatment. So the results are shown here for both the semantic variant and logopenic variant of primary progressive aphasia with the same color scheme. So in black is pretreatment, then we have post-treatment here, and then the three, six, and 12 months after treatment. And despite differing language profiles and severity, we see that individuals with both semantic and logopenic PPA showed significantly improved naming and maintenance of gains, as well as generalization to untrained lexical items. So research on PPA is still ongoing. There's research into the disease processes, what brain areas are affected, um, medical treatments, behavioral treatments, and family and caregiver training. One thing I wanted to mention is something that we don't do in our lab at UT, but that's um, becoming more popular in the field is TDCS, or transcranial direct current stimulation. This is a type of non-invasive brain stimulation that's uh, used to modulate cortical excitability. So you can see a woman here wearing it. Um, and the idea is that this neuromodulation that's offered with TDCS um, might, might be able to augment language therapy. And there's currently ongoing clinical trials for this. So I wanna talk about some communication tips for interacting with individuals with primary progressive aphasia. Um, so there's a nice little acrostic that the National Aphasia Association came up with. Um, ask simple direct questions, so multiple choice or yes, no. Provide multiple communication options, so encourage multimodal communication. Encourage drawing, writing it down, using gestures, facial expressions. Help the individual communicate if they ask. Um, oftentimes, People might want your help, but always ask first because sometimes they want to try and get it out. Acknowledge frustration. Acknowledge that you know that speaking and communicating is hard for them. On your end, you can also work on speaking slowly and clearly. If you don't understand, let the person know 
um, make sure to let them know when you're kind of having a communication breakdown so that you guys can work on it and get on the same page in the moment. And also allow them extra time both for understanding and for speaking. A couple other communication tips um, are be to eliminate distractions to make sure you have their attention. Keep communication simple but adult. So use simple sentences, more frequent words. So for example, cat instead of feline. Encourage talking around a word if they aren't able to get it. And that can not, not only help you get a better idea of what it is they're talking about, but it also might help them self-cue. Similarly, you can also give them the first sound if they're trying to come up with a word. Do comprehension check-ins. So summarize what you've gotten so far from what they've told you to make sure that you're understanding correctly. And also be positive. So make sure to try and avoid criticism and corrections. Other things to note are that fatigue can really affect communication. So you might want to have important conversations earlier in the day. And an important thing to also remember is that communication abilities can be inconsistent in PPA. Um, so sometimes it's really easy to do something and the next day it can be really difficult. And then two days later, it's easy again. It's kind of a moving target. Other tips are to treat the person with PPA as a conversational partner. To be sure and try and maintain and encourage social connections and encourage participation in activities that they feel capable doing. Um, so these might be activities where there's a little bit less focus on verbal communication. And also to include the person with PPA in decision making and planning as it's appropriate. Um, so we always like to advise people to plan early and plan ahead. I also want to highlight that we have a Central Texas Progressive Aphasia support group for individuals with PPA and their loved ones. Um, this is run out of a combination of the Aphasia Research and Treatment Lab, the Glenn Biggs Institute for Alzheimer's and Neurodegenerative Diseases at UT Health San Antonio, and the Comprehensive Memory Center at Dell. Um, and in this group, we provide education, we practice communication strategies, and it gives a great opportunity for both individuals with PPA and their caregivers to meet other people who are going through the same thing. Um, I've also listed our contact information for one of our group facilitators here. And finally, I want to talk a little bit about what our lab does. Um, and so we study how the brain supports speech and language processes, as well as how targeted treatment programs can improve communication impairments in individuals who have um, stroke-induced and neurodegenerative disease um, that results in aphasia. And we use uh, cognitive neuroscience, neuroimaging, and cognitive rehabilitation approaches to address these questions. We also provide um, in-person and tele-administered treatment. So if you are an individual who has communication difficulties caused by a stroke or neurodegenerative disease, um, if you have difficulty with word finding or are non-fluent, uh, please reach out to us. We would love to have you in our study. And for the individuals who belong to the populations that we specialize in, but who don't qualify for our studies, we're still able to provide evaluations, a few therapy sessions, and recommendations. Um, we're also always looking for control participants as well. Um, we want to thank the participants and their families who've helped us so far. Um, without them, none of this would be possible, as well as the members of the Aphasia Research and Treatment Lab. Thank you again for your time today, um, and please reach out with any questions that you might have.
so much for having me here. So I'm a registered nurse. I actually am a daughter-in-law of my mother-in-law who has Alzheimer's disease. So she lives with us. So many of the tips and tricks of things that I have learned along the way in the past 25 years, and they're also things that I'm doing as a daughter-in-law. My mom had passed away five years ago, and my mother-in-law is like my mom. I mean, she's my mom. So um, I work with Blue Water Home Care. We're a non-medical home care agency in uh, Leander, and we are uh, opening our new office. We actually are building a new office. It is um, just started. I'm super excited to announce it'll be done in about uh, off of Baghdad in about uh, two months. So we just broke ground. So very, very excited. So today we're going to talk about 10 effective medication uh, management tips for seniors. I wanted to start out with some statistics. So 89% of adults over 65 currently take prescription medication. And so I think that's a pretty daunting, I mean, nearly 100% of people take some type of prescription medication by the time that they're 65 years old. And 75% of 50 to 64 year olds currently take prescription medication. So um, it's a really important, medications are very important to keep us healthy but they're also something that could truly hurt us if we're not taking them appropriately. So some of these things are, are gonna be information that you can take on for yourself and they're gonna be things that you can share with your loved ones. Next is common mistakes. So polypharmacy. So what is poly? The word poly means many. Polypharmacy just means people are on a lot of medications. People don't know what medications they're on. They don't know what they're taking them for. They're interacting with one another. All of those things contribute to um, polypharmacy. Now, is it really a mistake? Probably not a mistake, but it's an issue that we see that we need to address. One of the issues that I see all the time, literally every day, is multiple physicians. And so I'll give you an example. You see a neurologist. Um, you go to UT and you see your, the neurologist, Dr. Bertelson, and then you go and you might see your primary care doctor, and then you see the nephrologist and, you know, the endocrinologist. And you're like, so one physician, um, one physician, you may have to see multiple doctors, but you need to make sure that you have a primary care physician, that all the stuff comes into that, that you know, provider, and they're able to sort of assimilate it all. The next is um, support of multiple family uh, members. Now, is that a mistake? Sometimes it can be. Um, you ever heard of the, uh, the daughter or the son that lives like super far away? Maybe you're taking care of mom. They jump in and they come in for a weekend and you've done everything wrong. I know that people have experienced that. Um, they think, so the support of family members is a wonderful thing, but it also can be something where there's contributing factors where you can have some issues with medications. Maybe one person agrees to certain medications. Maybe when one daughter is there, she's okay that her loved one is taking that, but maybe the other daughter is there and they're like, oh, no, 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 no. She doesn't need that medication to help her sleep at night. So that support, it's not necessarily a mistake, but it's something that we need to think about because it actually can impact medication management for seniors. So common mistakes, so side effects of, uh, of medication, so anticholinergic. So those are the types of medication that block the neurotransmitters. So many of, um, it's, that's the acetylcholine in your brain. That's where we're gonna be able to connect in the brain. And that's where your brain is responsible for um, connecting and certain cells that are gonna be communicating in your brain. So if you're taking certain medications like an anticholinergic, and we can talk about that a little bit more later, um, those are things that can um, block muscle movements. And that's things like issues with your lungs, your GI tract, and other areas of the body. So we're gonna talk about the beers list, B-E-E-R-S. We're gonna talk about that. And that's something that you wanna think about and we're gonna go over that. And so as you're looking at your current medication list or maybe your medication list for your loved one, it's important that you have that accurate list because you may have some medications on those lists. It doesn't mean that you don't take a medication that's on the beers list or any other you know, list for that matter. But what it says is you need to be aware of those side effects. And so one of the other mistakes that we have are no improvement on symptoms. So how many times have we or our loved one been prescribed medication for an ailment, you know, three weeks, four weeks down the line, it didn't work and you didn't follow up, which means you're, you know, one, it didn't work. 
Two, you didn't follow up with the doctor um, because COVID, life got in the way or whatever. So you're adding medication to your system when you necessarily don't need it and it's not working. So that's something important to think about. And also medications have not been adjusted. So again, I mean, simple common thing, maybe someone who has seizures. Um, that's pretty easy to manage. If you're having lots of seizures, then obviously you need to have the medications adjusted. But one of the things that we see when people are placed on um, medication for Alzheimer's or dementia, these medications don't necessarily work right away and they may not have an impact. They're gonna start on a very low level to begin with and then they're gonna titrate up. They call it titrate to effect. Well, what ends up happening is either they start the medication and they're like, a week later, they're like, you know, mom's like, this isn't helping me. I don't want to take it. Well, and there's maybe not a follow-up. You just let mom say that's okay, but there's no follow-up with the physician to say, well, when should I expect this medication to start working? And this could be any medication. Um, you know, things like anti-anxiety, they work pretty quickly. Antidepressants, they might take a week. They might take six weeks. Um, so again, those are things that you need to think about. And we probably need to do make some medication adjustments. That's one of the biggest mistakes that I see. So drug interactions. So again, you might think that's pretty simple. How many of you, and I can tell you I, I don't, um, when you go to the grocery store, HEB, or you pick up your meds at Walgreens and you get those little pamphlets, who actually reads those pamphlets? Does anybody? I see someone going, no. I mean, I think we do a little bit, you know, we're like, yeah, 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 we know that. Those drug interactions, which is why if you can't have the same physician, which probably isn't realistic, we're going to talk about having the same pharmacist. And that's important. Now, again, there's some times when you're going to have to get medications from maybe a people's pharmacy that may be a regular pharmacy or herbal supplements that you want to use that you can't necessarily get from HEB or Walgreens or CVS or wherever you get your medications. But it is important to have one point of contact that you can at least bring that list to, um, to him or her as a pharmacist. Um, so let's talk about undesired effects. So antihypertensive. So Antihypertensive just means it's medication to decrease your blood pressure. So sure, your blood pressure's up, you take medication, but one of the reactions is that your blood can, pressure can go really low, too low. And so a lot of times that is an undesired effect on a medication. And so that's where we kind of go back here where medications have not been adjusted. So communication with your providers is so important. If a person starts on a medication and they start acting, you know, weird, you need to let your doctor and or provider know. You need to let, let them know what's going on. They may say, that's a side effect that's um, common, and usually they go over that with you. But it could be something that might be, you know, you may have effects where you might be shaky or something with the medications. So I think you need to know about what those um, interactions are, and you need to know what the effects are going to be if you take those medications. So mistakes, high costs. How many of you, and I can tell you this just happened to us a couple weeks ago, one of our kids needed a very expensive breathing, you know, a breathing treatment. And um, I mean, it was like $140 or something. And how many times do you have to make the decision, sometimes financially, where you choose not to get a medication because it's so expensive? I know that's happened to people. Yeah, so she's saying yes, it absolutely happens. Now, what I would encourage you to do is when you're having the conversation with your, um, your physician, because again, think of it like this. If you go to the pharmacy and you go pick up a prescription and it's $140, but it's like a medication that like you really need, maybe it's a breather or some type of medication that's um, very expensive. It's usually not just one month you have to take the medication. It's a reoccurring cost. So this is where I encourage you in the beginning to have a conversation with your physician. So when, you know, or your practitioner, you know, when they say, we'd like to put you on X medication, your first thing should be, hey, is there a generic available? Can I have a sample? My dad is infamous. My dad is 88 years old. He lives in North Carolina. And um, he's so good about asking that. And I think you'd be surprised that 
even now, like if you're going into the doctor's office now, not a lot of people are going in there. So the pharmaceutical reps still are coming in there if they'll let them. And so you may have the opportunity to even get a one month supply or ask the doctor if you could do a trial first. Sometimes you can go in and you can go online and look for a rebate. You could look for a free trial. My husband was able to get, you know, one of those as well, but just those are one of those things. Don't think of your medication as a one-time charge. Think of it as a reoccurring charge and make sure that that's something that is reasonable for you. If it's not, you can ask the pharmacist to call the physician for um, you know, an alternative medication that's within your plan. If you have you know, Medicare Part D or you have just a regular plan. The other common mistakes are difficulty taking medication. So what does that mean? Well, it could mean um, it's somebody who can't swallow anymore. Maybe they need a liquid or maybe they are taking a pill, but it needs to be crushed now. So again, you need to be aware of what you're taking and is it something that you can crush or not crush? Because there's medications that have a special coating on it that is like an extended release medication. And what that means is that it's gonna give you a little bit of medication over the course of a day or course of a few hours. And those are not typically medications that you're supposed to you know, um, crush up. So if you have a loved one that has difficulty taking medications, those are things that you need to know. So if you're sending maybe a sibling to go with your parents or you know, whatever, they need to be aware. Because I can tell you, I had a situation with my daughter where I think she had some type of upper respiratory infection. They gave her a big horse pill, horse pill. My daughter looked at that and she was like, I can't, I can't swallow that. My daughter's 11, she couldn't swallow it. Um, and it was so big that we couldn't even cut it in half. It was, it was a nightmare. So we ended up having to call the doctor again and to just be aware, don't assume the doctor knows or the practitioner knows. The other is medications, can they or can they not be mixed with food? another one of the things that you need to know about. The other thing is you've got certain medications um, that have to be given like 30 minutes before medication. So like th uh, levothyroxine, which is a thyroid medication, that's supposed to be administered, I believe it's 30 minutes before, and I'm not a pharmacist, but I believe it's 30 minutes before you take um, any other food. And so those are things that are really important to know as you're, and the reason why is it decreases its effectiveness. Hello, I'm Alan Stevens of Baylor Scott & White. At Baylor Scott & White, I direct the Center for Applied Health Research, which includes a program of research that I lead that is focused on dementia care and then specifically family caregiving. The presentation today I'm making is called Family Caregiving, a cornerstone of our society. And I'm grateful for Alzheimer's Texas for allowing me to be part of this very important symposium. Family caregiving is intensely personal. Every family has a shared history. Every relationship between a person living with a dementia and their caregiver is unique. Whether if it be spouses of 40, 50, 60 years or more, or adult children caring for a parent, or treasured family members and friends stepping up to provide care for a person who has cognitive issues later in life. We also know that every person living with dementia has their own story. In fact, they have many stories, some of them their favorite stories that they love to tell over and over again. And although they struggle to remember some of the most important events in their life, the stories of their life that are important to them, they can tell again and again. That's family caregiving. And every caregiver, every family caregiver faces personal joys and struggles that can't be included in a single presentation. But I do wanna tell you my family caregiving story. This is a picture of me and my brother with my mother, Violet, at about the age of 90, after she was residing in a nursing home. 
And another picture of me and my sisters, also with my mother, Violet. What's not reflected in these pictures is a third sister, Laurie, who was my mother's primary caregiver for about three years. My mother lived in my sister's home and Laurie was her primary caregiver. About three months after being placed in a nursing home, my sister Laurie was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and died about six months later. My mother died about 14 months after that. So my sister, her primary caregiver, died about 14 months before my mother. And while that was a very, very hard time in the life and the experiences of my family, we made it through. My family cared for my sister, just as my sister cared for my mother. And then my family continued to care for my mother until she passed. That's our family story. And I know each of you have your own. For my family, we made it through. We supported each other and we came out all okay. I tell this story because each of our stories of our families and the caregiving that our families do is uniquely personal very important aspects and historical events in our families. And even though they're very unique and personal, they come together to tell a compelling story, a story that commands attention because more and more families are in the position of providing care. <clears throat> and this is reflected in a published report of AARP and the National Alliance for Caregiving. The report is called Caregiving in the US 2020, and it documents what many of us know, that the number of Americans providing unpaid care to a family member has increased dramatically in the last five years. And importantly, nearly one in five, or 19% of Americans are providing unpaid care to an adult with health our functional needs. This increase is particularly noted in those who are providing care for an older adult. So who are caregivers? Caregivers are us, a quote that comes from the report. Men and women, people of all ages, people who work, people who are retired. But more than ever, we focus our attention on those who are working. For 61% of family caregivers report that they hold jobs outside of the home. And 45% report that they've had at least one negative financial impact to their family from providing care. So although families are doing a job that they often report that they love and find meaning from, it doesn't come without consequences in many aspects of their life. And this is particularly true of caregivers who are working. We also see that how we provide care is changing. More than ever, Americans are providing for more than one person. More than ever, individuals, family caregivers are providing care for a person living with Alzheimer's disease or dementia. And we know that providing care for a person with dementia brings unique challenges. And one of them that's becoming of greater and greater importance and a focus is the amount of care coordination that family caregivers do for the person they're caring for. Care coordination means they're doing things like making doctor's appointments, getting their family members to the doctor's appointments, managing medications, and even managing transitions from home to hospital, to nursing home, back to home, all of those are duties that caregivers widely report. And not surprisingly, this extra duty that caregivers, that family members have in their role as family caregivers is also taking a toll on the health of families. 
as you can see on the slide, there's an increase in the number of caregivers who report their own care, their own health, as fair to poor. In fact, 23% of Americans say caregiving has made their care worse. This is a compelling story. And policymakers are taking attention, are, are, are paying attention to the story. And policymakers, as I say here, are connecting to the topic of family caregiving more than ever. And I want to share with you two examples to support my conclusion that policymakers, elected officials, are engaged in this topic. In 2016, the National Academy of Medicine published a report called Families Caring for an Aging America. This was, report was created by 15 to 16 experts in the field of family caregiving. Some were researchers, some were policymakers, some were caregivers. Their duty was to come together, review all of the published information available about family caregiving, and to come up with a consensus report that was to be reported to Congress. I'll focus on the aspects of the report that are related to dementia caregiving. And you won't be surprised that the report concluded that dementia caregiving is one of, if not the most demanding caregiving roles. Because caregiving for dementia patient can occur for a long period of time, it can be intensely sporadic at times, such as when a person with dementia is in the hospital. And it can include a wide range of activities, from household activities to making sure the person with dementia is bathed and dressed and has su sufficient nutrition. The report also highlights a comment I made earlier that caregivers are providing an expanded array of healthcare related supports, including care coordination, specialized medical tasks like wound care. And unfortunately, the report also includes stories of caregivers feeling marginalized or ignored by healthcare organizations. One of the most compelling quotes that is part of this report is that family caregivers often felt ignored by healthcare providers, yet expected to be there, to be in the home, to provide the day-to-day -day care for a person living with dementia. The report also documents negative outcomes that family members experience when caring for a person with dementia. Now, not everyone does, but there's a significant number of family caregivers who have negative physical outcomes, particularly sleep disturbances. Caregivers report their health as being poorer than non-caregivers. Caregivers commonly report feeling socially isolated excluded from activities because of their care giving activities. They report emotional distress, like anxiety and stress, and depressive symptoms because of the burden of care. And as we touched upon earlier, the financial impact of providing care cannot be overlooked. It comes in the form of out-of-pocket medical cost, as well as individuals feeling as though they have less income or less benefits or less retirement income because of their need to spend more time providing care in the home versus being in the workplace. The report concludes with a series of recommendations that were reported to the National Academy of Medicine, who in return reported to the Congress. The first and primary recommendation was that a national strategy for family caregiving be established. And it called upon specific federal 
departments to look into this issue, like the Department of Health and Human Services, the Department of Labor, and Veteran Affairs. <clears throat> and as you can see from the list here, the consensus report suggested that these agencies look very specifically at everything from how Medicare and Medicaid payments are provided to the training that's provided to long-term healthcare workers and to the availability of evidence-based programs to support family caregivers. The report also focused attention on the work that the states were doing, because many states are having, are putting forth very aggressive and innovative programs to support family caregiving, caregivers. So the states can learn from each other. And lastly, on the slide, all of this, all of these recommendations, all of what was learned in the report of families caring for an aging America should be viewed in the lens of the diversity of older adults and family caregivers. Our family structures are changing. Our families are becoming more diverse. And what worked in the past may not also work for us in the future. Rather, we need to understand how culture impacts the way we provide care to our family members. I'm happy to say that the report, Families Caring for an Asian Ameri Aging America, did result in the passage of legislation called the RAISE Act. And I wanna provide you an overview of that today. The slides I'm presenting were created by the Administration for Community Living, who is the lead federal agency in charge of moving this important legislation, the RAISE Act, from being a law into being reality to inform Congress. RAISE, recognize, assist, include, support, and engage family caregivers, began in the fall of 2017. It passed the House later that year, the Senate early in, 20, in, in 2018, and was signed into law by the president and is now being enacted with the leadership of the Administration on Community Living. And a group of 16 individuals who are non-federal employees who were appointed by the Secretary of Health and Human Services to put together a report that would inform a strategy for family caregiving in the United States. The chair of this group is Lance Robertson, the administrator and the Assistant Secretary of Aging at HHS. Uh, there are three non-federal co-chairs, and I'm honored to be one of those co-chairs. There are two members from the state of Texas who serve on the Family Caregiving Advisory Council. In addition to myself, Carol Zerniel of the WellMed Foundation also serves as a non-federal representative to this council. What is this all about? RAISE is designed to bring forth a family caregiving strategy. That strategy cannot be the opinion of one or two people. Rather, it needs to be informed by the federal agencies who provide support to older adults and family caregivers. And it needs to be guided by the Family Caregiving Advisory Council. Importantly, it must reflect the needs of a diverse group of family caregivers, diverse across the age span, which means individuals caring for younger adults with disabilities, as well as families caring for older adults with cognitive or functional disabilities. The charge is to submit a report to Congress that would lead to a national strategy 
to support all family caregivers. That strategy should include some very important aspects as written into the law. Those are shown here. Key to what the strategy should inform is the adoption of personal and family-centered activities. Assessment and service planning is important because as I said in the beginning, every family story is different. Every family has unique needs, but we don't know what those needs are unless we do specific assessments of the family needs and design plans that support them. Clearly respite options are needed. The financial security and workplace security of caregivers should also be supported. In addition to those issues and those principles that I mentioned in the previous slide, the RAISE Act also mandates that the federal agencies come together and report an inventory of all of the programs that they have in place to, su to support family caregivers. Furthermore, that report should include how are these programs functioning, the number of individuals served, and the outcomes. That is, how are they impacting the lives of family caregivers? This is an important step for us to understand what's available to family caregivers that will lead to a better understanding of where are the gaps and where do we need new public programs. As a member of the committee of the RAISE Family Caregiving Advisory Committee, I can tell you there are some key topics that are central to the discussions of the committee. One is increased public awareness. Our society needs to know the value of family caregiving, the impact of family caregiving on families, and really we need to make the case that caregiving is the cornerstone of our society. Families come together to provide a service that's meaningful to them and that provides great value to our healthcare system. Therefore, we should in turn create support programs that are family centered. They're really based upon the understanding of how families provide care and the unique, unique cultural aspects of providing care. Third, we must encourage that all formal caregivers, that is healthcare providers and long-term care providers, those who provide professional services to individuals who require care, respect and engage the family caregiver in care delivery. Fourth, we need to protect the family's financial security. Families often take on additional caregiving expenses, often called out-of-pocket expenses, which can devastate the family's financial status. And family caregiving can also create challenges in the workplace by pulling family members out of the workplace to stay home to provide care. That can be detrimental to the employer as well as to the family member who is pursuing a career. Lastly, we need to know more about the family caregiving experience, whether it be research, reports, stories, you name it. We need to know more about how families are caring, what that caring experience brings to the family, and what families need so they can continue to play this role. For many caregiver families tell us it's what they want to do. It's what they feel compelled to do. It's what they get meaning from. We need to know more about that family caregiving experience. So we know how to innovate formal 
dementia care services. That is the way older adults with dementia receive care from their health care providers, their long term care providers, and how they are supported by their communities. Thank you for being here today. And I want to direct you to two websites that you can learn more about the RAISE Family Caregiving Act. And lastly, I want to thank my colleagues at Baylor Scott and White, and in particular, the Santa Fe Foundation that created the endowed chair I hold, which in part has supported parts of my presentation today. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Thomas, and I'm a project manager at the Baylor Scott & White Research Institute Center for Applied Health Research. Here at Baylor Scott & White, we understand that providing care and support to a loved one with dementia can be a difficult and stressful job. But caregivers can benefit when they access the right tools and information to support them in this role. More and more, caregivers are turning to the internet as their preferred method to access valuable resources for information and skills. At Baylor Scott & White, we are looking to better understand how to best support caregivers using online tools. We have developed two online systems for caregiver education and support, and we are testing those systems as part of a research study. We're interested in enrolling dementia caregivers like you into the study from the communities we serve. Right now, we are enrolling dementia caregivers who are 18 years or older and who both speak and write English. Eligible caregivers are ones providing at least eight hours per week of care and or supervision. Remember, dementia care is very broad and could include things like meal preparation, running errands, handling finances, or dealing with medical issues. We are looking to recruit caregivers who regularly access the internet using a home computer or tablet. Our systems are not currently mobile friendly quite yet. We are looking to recruit caregivers from these counties you see on your screen in Central Texas. Finally, even though this study is being conducted by Baylor Scott & White, you don't have to be a Baylor Scott & White patient, and we will not be accessing your medical record for any reason. If you decide to get in touch with us, we'll start off with a brief phone call, about 15 minutes. One of the study staff will talk to you a little bit more about the study, answer your questions, and ask you a few questions to see if you are eligible. Next, we'll schedule an intake phone call. During the intake phone call, we'll get an electronic signature on a consent form and ask you questions about your caregiving situation and questions related to your stress levels and emotional well being. Next, a computer will randomly put you into one of two groups. In the Game Plan for Care group, you will get access to the Game Plan for Care system for six months. The system has information and videos designed to help you address caregiving issues. You will receive regular email contacts and there will be four phone call visits with your dementia care specialist that will be scheduled when it's convenient for you. In the Resources for Care group, you will get access to the Resources for Care system for six months. The system also has information designed to help you address caregiving issues. You will also receive email outreaches and supportive phone calls. Both groups have access to a dementia care specialist throughout the six months. A dementia care specialist is a trained professional who can answer questions, problem solve, and provide support as you are trying to achieve specific goals and overcome issues in your caregiving role. At the end of six months in either group, there will be another assessment phone call where we will follow up with you and see how you're doing. Also, you may be eligible to receive two $30 gift cards during your time in the study for participating. If you're interested and want to learn more, we're working closely with Alzheimer's Texas to assist with study recruitment. 
please contact Shannon using the email address on your screen and she can forward your information to us. Remember, by expressing your interest to Shannon, you are not agreeing to participate. You're just giving the Baylor Scott and White study team permission to contact you to discuss the study further. I want to take this opportunity to thank Alzheimer's Texas for their support on this project, and I want to thank each and every one of you for taking the time to consider if contributing to this research project might be a worthwhile endeavor for you.